This is Hannibal here from TheHannibalTV.com and on the line we have Golden Boy, Jerry Gray, a professional wrestling legend that's been fighting through some health battles in recent years. How are you doing today, sir? Uh, it's a pleasure to be on your uh, deal, your show, uh, Hannibal. I'm actually a fan of all your shoot interviews and work you do, Just watching them all, so well, definitely that- waiting for... Go ahead. That's a pre- much appreciated for sure, and I heard that uh, you watched some of the Billy Jack Haynes clips recently. He had no one to see that because I knew him back when 1984. He uh, we were in Florida here together, and he sent me to uh, Portland where I got a big break out there, tight team with Tom Pritchard and everything. And then he, uh, but he he was a guy you didn't want to. I mean, he had a temper definitely. Thank God I was a good friend of his and everything, but he. <laughs> He was wild back then, even. He's a great guy, though. I just got to get to know him. He's different. Did you ever see him in action in one of his... Uh... No. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one time, I just well, a fan just came up, like a big country-type country, country type fan, and I think it was Washington or somewhere out there, Oregon, maybe. And uh, he just asked, how do I get into wrestling? Real nice, you know. Billy Jack got him in a full mouth and started banging his head on the, the brick wall until I had to just pull him off of him. I mean, the guy's bleeding and everything. I was like, okay, man, that's, you know, he, he didn't really do anything bad. I thought you get in wrestling. So get for the people, uh, the people <laughs> saying that Billy might be exaggerating the number of oh, no. altercations, he's not. Well, well, I've never seen any, no, I've never seen him back down from anyone, that's for sure. Yeah, he, <laughs> no. So you grew up, I guess, in Ohio, where uh, the Sheik would have been running mainly when you were younger? Yeah, the Sheik, Johnny Powers. My favorite part of it was Johnny Powers and Pedro Martinez out of Buffalo. They came to Akron where I lived, and the Sheik had his stuff too, but I liked the NWF, it was called better. Johnny Powers, Johnny Valentine was there, I blew the butcher and all of them. Um, Ernie even had all, a, lot of, had a lot of good names. So it was the same, almost the same group as IWA had later. You know, with Eric the Red and all of them, Ox Baker and everybody. Uh, I think Johnny Powers was company. involved in the IWA booking as well, wasn't he? Yeah, he was. Yeah, he was. Yeah, he was. Yeah, I like that. That was a hell of a great promotion. They had some, I mean, for back in those days, they had some huge houses in Akron. At the uh, Akron Armor, it was called. They had like 3,000 people every week. And the Sheik didn't draw that good there, honestly, unless he came. Like, because he would send just like his... You know, the Poffo, like Randy Poffo was like first match. And Lanny was the champ, tag team champion with his dad. And Randy was more like the underneath guy. Randy, because he was so small back then. Randy Poffo, yep. I'm not sure what happened to Johnny Powers. I met him about uh, 12 years ago or so. He actually invited me to his house for dinner. Oh. And at that time, he was getting into MMA promotion, but I heard that yeah. The event that he was planning to put on got canceled, and then he kind of disappeared oh. off the face of the earth. I see him in 2005, I think it was at that um, thing in Toronto. What was that called? The, they moved it to Texas now. something or other. Yeah, I think it's the Hall of Fame thing. George Steele was part of it, and all of them, and they moved it to Texas now, I guess, with Johnny Mantell. I think it's called the well, Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame, maybe. Yes. They had it in Toronto back then, at that time I went, and I, that's why I met him. Johnny Powers was there, and all the, uh, one of the Love Brothers, and Bruce Swayze, and Missing Link. A bunch of guys there. Who actually um, trained you for wrestling? Louis Tillette. Oh. He was like a, back in, he was like on Eddie Graham's main bookers for a long time, and a big booker in a lot of territories. He wrestled too, but um, yeah, he was, 50 some 56 when he trained me and he's still alive now so he, that was 38 years ago so <laughs> I can't believe he's still going wasn't he involved with Hulk Hogan's early career as well yeah yeah Hogan even says it and uh, he said that uh, Louis Gillette's the one that gave him his break because he was booking in uh, Ron Fuller's territory there in uh, Alabama uh, Louis Gillette was and he brought um, they didn't want him down here in Florida you know here my suit and Eddie Graham and all of them Hogan they, they didn't like him and then so they, uh, somebody called Louis Tollette. I think it was maybe Billy, either Billy Graham or Bob Roop. I can't remember which one Hogan said. The one you can really believe. But the, I think Billy Graham had something to do with it too. 
I know that. But anyway, they, and then uh, Louis Tillett's the one that started pushing him, put him against Andre and everything there in Alabama. Had a huge out, outdoor stadium show. Drew a big, huge house. That's where he first got his break, though, because nobody else was even interested in big guys like that back then because he was really green. Did you this have any <laughs> uh, any trouble getting into the business? Because uh, back in the 80s, I guess, it was still difficult to find people to train you. Oh, yeah. I, I started trying when I was 16 years old because I, I, I wrestled amateur and all that, and I knew I wanted to be a pro wrestler all the years since I was a kid. And then, then I got pretty big, so I looked you know, older than 16. So I went to uh, Great Malenko in Tampa, Boris Malenko, when I was only 16, and he was going to train me. But then he's, I, was, I didn't even, I didn't even start driving yet or anything. <laughs> so I was like, um, Tampa was like an hour and a half. I don't know where to get there. Three times a week, I think he was going to train me. I went there once or twice, but I think, well, and then a year later, I went to Louis Tillet. Finally, I started driving and everything. But I started like when I just, right before, well, I was really 17 still when I first started. My first match was on Georgia Championship Wrestling against the, uh, Ernie Ladd and Iron Mike Sharp tag team. That was like really a good thing to have instead of having like a small independent match or something. It was like go on TBS with all the big guys, but it was really hot too. I mean, TBS, like everybody was there that day. <laughs> Dusty Rhodes, I mean, everybody in wrestling was on the on the, on the taping that day. And I got Ernie Ladd, like by the second tallest biggest guy in the business was that Andre. Was and it uh, only booking then? <laughs> No, it was George Scott. Okay. George Scott. That's, uh, yeah, he was booking the first short time, and then Ole did come in. Like, oh, if he, he didn't stay very long, George Scott, then Ole came, like, a few weeks later. And Ole was kind of a jerk at first to me, because he, uh, have you ever interviewed him or not, not Ole? No, I haven't been down to Atlanta <laughs> yet to do it, but maybe one yeah. of these days. Yeah, because he, uh, I was in the dressing room with one of the other guys that Lloyd Tillette trained and sent us up there, and uh, I didn't want to be like him. Back then, uh, there was like a, you're a mark if you want to take a picture with some of the stars, you know? So I didn't want to do it, and this guy told me, the other guys I trained with me, asked me to take a picture of him with somebody, Michael Hayes or somebody. So I'm taking a picture of him with my, you know, dress clothes on still. And then Ole comes in, he just started booking, he goes, hey, what the hell are you doing in the dressing room? Get the hell out. He thought I was a fan, you know? Yeah. I said, no, I'm a, I'm a worker. And then, uh, thank God, Louis told me a few of the, because back then the handshake was like, you don't even touch hardly and a lot different. Everything. I don't know he even does that, I don't think anymore. And he goes, well, who trained you? And uh, I didn't realize that Ole is one of the only guys Ole likes is Louis Tillette. He loves Louis Tillette because Louis Tillette gave him a big break and everything when he was looking at Atlanta back in the, whenever he first went there, early 70s, I guess. But I said, Louis Tillette, and he goes, Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, he was all nice to me then after that. <laughs> I was like, damn, trying to kick me out of the dressing room. <laughs> yeah, you know? nowadays all the wrestlers are taking pictures backstage. That's one of the things yeah. I don't like to see. Uh, I didn't, nobody did that back in the, I mean, they, you didn't even really tell them that you were a fan of their, I mean, unless you got to know them real good. Like I would tell, I knew Sir Oliver Humperdinck real good, and we'd ride together. I told him that I used to throw uh, quarters at him when he was, you know, walking out to Orlando Sports Stadium, and he said, "What do I do to make you mad?" I said, "Just the way he looked." He started cracking up. <laughs> you know what? He, you remember what he looked like, right? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was funny. But uh, yeah, and then I was going to tell you too. At time that I was on the uh, the small plane, we had to go to the Bahamas in like broken down. I shouldn't have been flying some junky plane. It was me, superstar Billy Graham, because I know you're good friends with him. And um, it was 1983, so I'm like 19 years old. It was Billy Graham, Kevin Sullivan, Ron Bass, and me, I think, and the pilot. And then there was a small plane. I held that, like five, six, well, six people, yeah. So then, I mean, it was like, the, I think we were, we were ready to crash because the pilot was freaking out. We were going all over the sky. I mean, a bad storm with Florida and I was going to the Bahamas. And then they it scared the crap out of me because I had never... I don't think I'd ever flown. I know I'm never on a small plane. I already had maybe one flight in Charlotte when I worked for Mid Atlantic. They flew to Toronto, Maple Leaf Gardens a couple of times, shot there, but um, I wasn't really flying much yet at that time. I was 19. So I thought we were going to die, and they're all praying. Everybody was really grand member that I emailed them once and said, Yeah, brother. <laughs> Remember, we were like, We're going to die. They were all praying. I was just looking at everybody like, Is this a joke? Oh, what the hell? I'm going to die on my first 
flight to the Bahamas. Yeah, but I thought that was pretty weird. I've heard those Bahama people. trips were nightmares in general. Oh, yeah, just to be a heel alone. Yeah, and they did me the favor to let me beat the guy that was so popular there. He was a, he was from over there, Tyree Pride. And I didn't realize when I went there, <laughs> the people, how mad they were going to be. Because I had the belt, and I, I was like, I wait to let him get it back, drop it back to him that night. But uh, um, I remember it was like huge crowd. And then back then, over there, it was they charged like 20 bucks for tickets. And that was like 86. And like in all the other territories, I mean, it was only like maybe 10 at the most for length time. But that's the you could get usually like 8 bucks or something. They were like $20 tickets or more than that, maybe. And it was packed. I mean, so big that you wouldn't believe the crowd. Wow. And we were the main, we were the main event. And Ric Flair was the world champion against uh, Wahoo that night. Mm-hmm. And he knew that, that oh, Tyree Pry was more over than any of them. Even he was, You've heard of him, right, Tyree Pry? Yeah. He's not, okay. He was so over in the Bahamas, nowhere else really. But And, and, he, and Ric Flair said that, uh, and he knew the people came to see him beat me back for that belt. So he said, no, let, let them go on last. Because, you know, he, he didn't want to go you know, follow Tyree Pry and win his belt back. So then we got to be the main event over Ric Flair, the world champion. But the payoff sucks so bad, you wouldn't even believe it. I mean, Ric Flair got 10%, and the crowd was probably $30,000 at least, maybe more. I don't even know. They don't tell you the truth. Like them. I'm sure they do now. But anyway, um, so he would have got 3000 10% of the $30,000 crowd, you know. I remember I got 300 bucks when I was late in Tyree. So I was still complaining. If, if Wahoo was still booking, we would get a thousand at least. I'm not gonna go complain. I'm happy to have a job here. Jeez, it was hard to get in, you know, Florida rough at that time. Did you so ever anyway, get the was, chance to go out with uh, Flair on any of your tours with him? Oh uh, yeah, I was in Charlotte with him, and I lived with Gene Anderson and uh, Jake Roberts, and so um, for like a year. So Jake, I mean, uh, Gene was really good friends with Flair, so he'd always be over there at our apartment and everything. And then I never. Well, I think I did go to a bar a couple times, but he didn't. I think I left before he started doing all the real crazy stuff. I usually found the grill and got the hell out of there. <laughs> so maybe you could answer the question, did the hockey talk man hitting Jake the Snake with the guitar really cause his drug use, like Jake has said, or was he... Hell no. Yeah. Shit, he was... I was 1983. I lived up there, and he... <laughs> I, I mean, I, I love Jake, but he... We have, like, a problem now, because... Uh, you probably heard some of this. I mean, I used I had a lot of shows that I ran all the '90s, you know, big ones everywhere, and I used him on the top matches usually against Honky Tonk Man, and he'd always be calling me, calling me. I've told the story before, but he'd be calling me and telling me to send him the, you know, set deposit. He needs he's got to get out of jail or whatever, and then he'd end up not wanting the money again. So it ended up I kept track of it. Ended up being thousands of dollars by the time. And then when I needed something, a favor, it was like he just ignored me. He's doing pretty good, you know, now. A couple of years ago, I, I you know, they just ignored everything. They called him everything. So anyway, uh, that's a problem I have with him. But I like him for what he did. He did teach me a lot because he'd already been in the business for like, that's probably five, six years longer than me. So he, I mean, I moved in with him because I was friends with him in Florida when he was down here in 82. And then I went up to Charlotte. Dusty Rhodes sent me up there to work full time. Well, J.J. Dillon mainly. Dusty was his. Dusty was the booker in Florida, and JJ was his assistant. So, JJ how was your experience there. with Dusty? He was good to me. Yeah, because he—I uh, mean, I was green, really green, and he—they um, didn't like local guys. Betty Graham. <laughs> I had a good experience with him. He hated uh, independent outlaw. They called him now, yeah. and and Louis and Louis Tillet went against him and kind of scared him because uh, Louis Tillet had Austin Idol at first and he was hot right off TBS I mean, at that time. It was 1980, 81, I think, 80 or 81. And he had uh, Jimmy Vine at first. He had Thunderbolt Patterson. He had some na- people that were still big names. You know, in Florida had a TV show against Eddie Graham. And Eddie Graham was getting scared but Eddie Graham started running two shows a week in Orlando. So Louis Tillet would run Friday at the arena here and then uh, Eddie Graham would run Friday too, just to go a Louis show and Sunday. I never seen a promotion do that. Two shows in one week. He didn't care if he drew because he owned, owned the arena anyway. Eddie Graham did. He didn't care if he just drew, you know, a thousand instead of three or five thousand. That's what he usually drew every week. <laughs> but uh, and then Louis did kill his, his crowd pretty bad, you know. But he, and then 
it was not bad for Moshe Alperez started there, Buddy Landell. Um, I remember a lot of guys were, but the names they had were good at first. Were independent, definitely, back in them day. And then what happened, though, was then Louis Train started the wrestling school at the same time as he had that promotion, trained me and, and really me and Larry Hamilton. You ever heard of Larry Hamilton? Yeah. Okay. He, we're the only ones that ever really, you know, went to different territories and worked all over for all the years and stuff. But he, uh, he trained us, and then um, I went up to I didn't understand how the heat was with, you know, Outlaws and Eddie Graham and all this stuff, so... I just called J, uh, whoever the booker was. J.J. was booking at that time when I first called down to Tampa. And J.J. with Dory Funk. And then they said, okay, come meet us at the Orlando Sports Stadium. I brought him a picture. He didn't have even tapes yet then. You know? So he uh, he said, okay, we'll book you for TV next Tuesday or whatever. I get there. Eddie Graham loves me at first because I was 18 years old, young, you know, good build, everything. He's loving me. Oh, you wrestled amateur too? Oh, he loved all that, everything, you know, until... Who trained you? I said, Louis Tillet. He looked at me like he wanted to kill me. <laughs> and then Eddie Graham was, you know, pretty scary guy. Some of the stuff he'd do. I don't know how tough he was as far as, like, going to shoot, but he would do some nasty stuff. That I'm, heard you, I'm sure you heard from Bob Roop, you know. Yeah. Some of the stuff he made him do on that snake foot. Because Matsuda had me help him turn a few guys, and I would just show him how to really work, and he'd be like, do that. No, do it hard, hard. I'm like, what the hell? Train the guys on how to work hurt people. Anyway, <laughs> so Eddie Graham looked at me and said, Louis Tillet, and he goes, I can't believe all the years this business was good to him and he hurt the business. And then stupid me, 18 years old, I go, how did he hurt the business? <laughs> it's like, you're arguing with Eddie Graham, the genius. <laughs> it was like, and he looked at me and goes, he trained people right up the street because back then, like I said, there was hardly, I mean, Kelly Kowalski had a wrestling school and Malenko, but Eddie Graham didn't like him at all either. That's about the one of the and then there was a couple of other ones like in Tennessee, um, the one of the train hockey pump man, Herb Welch, I called him too. They told me three hundred bucks that was the cheapest one I could find, but it was like Tennessee, it's too far for me. I can't even go to Tampa. Yeah, I'm sixteen years old. <laughs> so he uh yeah, but anyway, Eddie Graham made me pay some dues for that. First first he loved me. I should have never said that damn name when Louis Colet trained me. And then he said, Okay and he changed the match and put me against uh, Haku that's for my first uh, first uh, TV match on Florida. How was that? No, what, oh no, it wasn't even TV. That's right. It was uh, Jacksonville Coliseum. And I think he just told him to kill me, and I didn't understand because uh, Louis Tillet was an old timer, so he trained but stiff. He didn't really expose the business because he never even really told me. Really, and I learned everything on the road and from people like Jake and Dory fucking everybody. But he, he didn't really expose too much. I mean, he was stiff as hell when he trained us. So I thought it was just a normal thing. So I'm sitting there fighting the Haku back, stiff back with him, you know. <laughs> so he's getting madder and madder. And this is back when he was in shape like hell, too. King Kong Tonga, they called him. Yeah. That big afro. And he was doing every martial art and every whatever the hell he knew. Assume everything he could make. Of. I, I had red marks all over my whole body. and uh, but I survived it, and then he liked me after that for some reason. I guess because I kept fighting back. I thought it was just the way it's supposed to be. I was like, damn, this stuff. No, it's sick as I thought it was. <laughs> and then uh, afterwards, he liked me, though, I remember. Uh, I talked to him. Because then he wouldn't even touch me after that. He was really easy all the other matches. Go ahead. Did you ever see him in action? Mm, uh, no, but he told me a lot. I rode with him a lot of times. He told me about that. But even back then, he told me but some guys knows a lot at a bar. This is back before he didn't think he liked to bite nose, nose us off. I know that. But he, uh, I remember him saying that once. I was like, what the hell? I, I think was he like stopped years that old. finally <laughs> when he got sued and he oh, like yeah. paid yeah, yeah. a lot of money. WWE, yeah. yeah. He, did, he did that in Nick Goulas' t- territory, he told me. So that was probably like late 70s, maybe. He did it in some bar or somebody called him some name. I'm not going to say. And then and he, he said he bit the guy's nose off. I was like, Jesus Christ. I never heard of nothing like that. But anyway, yeah. That's who Eddie Graham let me have my initiation to being trained by Louis Tillet. But then Eddie Graham liked me after I, he just wanted to see if I'd quit, I guess. Because then I came back to the dress room and I kind of caught on to it. Like, okay, he's trying to see if I'll, you know, be assist and say, oh, yeah, I can't wrestle him, I'm hurt. I just asked him, well, when's the next match? He looked at me like I was crazy. Eddie Graham, <laughs> after Tonga tried to kill me. Were but you in the like, territory when uh, Eddie Graham killed himself? 
No, I was in Oregon. That's when I built my jacket set me to Oregon. Okay. I was still in Oregon. I was there for over a year. Yeah, I remember. Um, I'm like, I guess. I don't, I don't know if you know uh, Ed Wisgoski, Colonel Debeer. I've never met uh, him, but I know who he is. Okay. <laughs> he, he, uh, I'm standing there with Bobby Jaggers, and Jaggers was sad about Eddie Graham. And, um, and uh, um, I mean, I didn't have nothing against him, but a lot of guys didn't like him because his payoffs were pretty horrible for the huge houses he had, you know. And uh, he, uh, Ed Wisgoski, walked up to me and goes, Congratulations. I didn't even know. And he goes, I said, what? And he goes, Eddie Graham has kind of shot himself. I was like, oh, my God. It's a real nice thing. <laughs> and Bobby Jaggers was like, oh, my God, Ed. It's horrible. Yeah, so that's how I found out. <laughs> Ed Wisconsin must not have had a good experience when he was down here. How was but, your yeah, experience in the Pacific Northwest? Because I've always heard that was a, a good territory to work for. Oh, yeah. It was a lot of fun. It wasn't like, Oh, I, cause I had been to like, uh, I mean, my first territory full time was Charlotte, like, <laughs> as big as you can get. So it was like so professional and everything. And then, then I, Florida was big time. Everybody had an office and all the stuff, you know, and then I worked Memphis for, for Lawler and Jarrett and all of them. And then Louisiana, Bill Watts and all that before I went to Oregon. So I went to Oregon. I was like, what the hell? That really wasn't even a booker. It was just like whoever got Don Owen's ear at that time. And, and Buddy Rose had that right then. Billy Jack had it more than anybody, but he was still in Florida. He just sent me over there in you know, Oregon. And then uh, Billy, uh, Buddy Rose had more than anybody. He could be do anything he wanted, in other words. And Rip Oliver tried to, but he, he didn't have the full like uh, Buddy did. So then Buddy was friends with Billy Jack, so he told uh, Billy Jack, said, what the hell, they got Jerry in the second man. I want him on top. And then, uh, so then all of a sudden Buddy makes me his partner. So we were like in the main event against uh, Tom Pritchard and uh, Buzz Sawyer's brother, Hack Sawyer. Putting the uh, Hack Sawyer out of there, and uh, it pushed me big time then just because of that connection with um, what you call it, Buddy Rose had with Don Owens. And uh, I remember Griff Oliver was so mad. It was weird, the politics and the business back then. I was still young, so I didn't understand. All of a sudden, I was getting real good heat, you know. And all of a sudden, Griff Oliver said, Oh, we're kind of buddy did something. He was like disappearing. I think he owed Billy Jack like 10 grand. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he, he kind of skipped that town and left a little left. And then uh, the lady went to kill him. And then uh, I remember Rip Oliver then all of a sudden gets his idea to turn me babyface. So I never wanted to be a babyface, but I, I thought it was he was doing me a favor, you know. Because then he got to be kind of like, it wasn't really the title of the booker, but he got to run it because Buddy wasn't there. So all of a sudden now he's getting uh, Don Owens here. So then he said, we're going to turn your baby face and make you partners with Tom Pritchard and make you the champions and everything. And then I realized, okay, that's, that later, you know, a couple of years later, I realized, okay, that's because I had good heat. And I was, you know, he, he's the top heel, so that's what you do. You make the guy a baby face instead. <laughs> Take your spot. <laughs> it was weird. But it was a good thing, though. I learned a lot tagging with Tom Pritchard for a long time. Did you ever get a match with the uh, original Sheik in your career? No, I met him, though, in Hawaii. What was he, he got like in person? <laughs> it was weird. I was I was sitting with, uh, and I didn't know how, Antonio and Nookie. It was right before I was supposed to go to Japan, for New Japan. And uh, I, I had they booked me in Hawaii first to work with Muda. And I was friends with Muda already from being in Florida with him. So me and Muda flew there together from Tampa and Ken and Nakasaki, I think. Yeah, so we were left sitting there, and it was, Everybody was on that damn card. I think it's on YouTube. It was like some kind of show. Liam Ivia was partnered with Antonio and Nookie, and Brody was there, everybody. You name it, was there. The Sheik, um, Mark Lewin, everybody. You can name them almost. In the, so there was like so many people on that huge Honolulu Stadium. I can't remember. Aloha Stadium. Or something. Huge place. But anyway, so I'm sitting with the Japanese guys because I know Muda and, and Kenda. Here comes Antonio and Nookie. I didn't know he was like, Usually, like, I mean, a rock star. You, you didn't even see him. And when I went to New Japan, I never even seen him anywhere in the dressing room, just in the ring against him or something, you know. He like, had his entourage, and he was like a, I mean, rock star. But he, uh, I'm, I'm like, telling me, you go to Japan, too. He talks pretty good English, too, compared to what he acts like he does on, you know, some shows I've seen. Him on. Somewhere he did an interview with somewhere in California. I'm like, I think, I like, just like, I'm perfect to me. He said, watch the, the tape on the monitor here. This is the way the Japanese do it. And then uh, 
So anyway, and then Fujinami comes over because it's the respect thing. Then I've never been to Japan. Don't forget yet. Yeah. He starts. He starts unlacing Anuki's boots for him, and I thought he was joking. I mean, I'm sitting right by both of them. I never seen nothing like that before. A big star like Fujinami doing that. And he's taking that's how much respect he had. And then I kind of started laughing a little. I thought it was a rip, you know. And then Anuki told him to quit. I was like, Oh God, I got heat already. But well, I don't think he cared that much. But I was like, Oh shit! I guess that's uh, something they do over there for the young, you know. Because I remember when Ben Law was one of the guys there. They were training, you know. He had to, he did that stuff, carry our bags and everything. Chris Benoit and then was that other big guy, Max Payne. Can't remember his real name. Was yeah, he just over passed there. away. I think uh, he, he did. Daryl um, Peterson, I think his name is. Yeah, the big. He was what? in WCW. Yeah, the Max Payne and some other name. He was with Cactus Jack, maybe, I think. Tag team and some Oh, never uh, mind. I'm having okay. confused with Max Muscle. Max oh, Payne, I, I think, is still alive. I didn't hear that one. No. He's the one that recorded all the guys on tape and got heat in WWF. Everybody partying and doing... Yeah, what the, What was that all about? <laughs> I don't know. He thought he was going to sell it, I guess. And I guess I must not have made... Not much money, although, because you never heard of him. I never heard of him being for sale or anything. Yeah, I heard everybody was pissed at him. Oh, I know that. <laughs> so, um, yeah, you was asking about the Sheik, though. He was in Hawaii that night, though, at the, that stadium. And I, I was like, I was always like a big fan of his because I grew up, you know, watching him, too. So he, uh, and he was so mysterious. They never did anything on camera ever in his whole life, ever. And then, you know, you know no Americans, only uh, whatever that language he was speaking. <laughs> I was too, I was too. Anyway, he uh, he walked in the dress room, and then all the Japanese guys, like Ken and Nagasaki, had been in the business forever. And and Ken Nichols, oh, she, he pointed to him. I remember when I was a young boy, oh, and he was like really respect, you know. And the sheik looked at me and said hi. <laughs> I was like, he just looked at me and me and looked at my memory and everything. And then uh, and then I found out he got in trouble right before that for smoking pot in the dress room with uh, Mark Lewin. Uh, Lars Anderson, <laughs> Lars Anderson came in and said, "Quit smoking fucking pot in the damn dress rooms." Help the matter with you guys, because he ran, you know, with Leo Maivia. Yeah, and I don't know that shit. <laughs> I was like, "Oh my god, she smoked on pot." It's like, I don't know how old he, he was at that time, but he pretty old. It was funny. But yeah, that's the only time I never wrestled him. Though, go ahead. You also wrestled uh, Terry Funk, who's obviously a huge yeah. legend. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, I liked working Terry. You never knew what the hell was going to happen, but it was going to be crazy. You know that. He, uh, yeah, there was like a trash can full of all the nasty crap people were putting in it. Like everything was in it, beer cans with beer in it and everything. He went to put it over my head, and then I put it on him instead. It was pretty funny. I think that's what he wanted anyway. You never know. No, I remember the first time that I ever saw, besides Randy Savage doing it in uh, the pile driver on Ricky Morton breaking the table. You know. Yeah. The first time I ever seen anyone have you slam them through a table, Terry Funk told me to slam them. On the, we were outside fighting, you know, in the audience, and then I slammed him. <clears throat> he stood on it first and jumped up in there and fell on it. This is right when he did that movie, uh, Roadhouse, because he was in real good shape, too, and everything. Yeah. And then he, he fell on it, though, first to make it more, you know, because it was a solid table. And then I slammed him through it, and I was like, what the hell? So, I mean, it was like 1988 on my show and everything. I'd only seen uh, Savage do it to Morton's one one I've ever seen before that do it, break a table. Is it true Terry that uh, you train Billy Gunn? Yeah, but he don't like to say it. I don't know what his problem is, but I have tapes and there's a lot of wrestlers that seen him. Ask Bob Cook. <laughs> He's seen him in the ring train at my show. Bob Cook worked on my show. And then, uh, yeah, we, we had some heat. I don't want to say it. I don't want to make him mad because we got to be friends. He started working on my shows like in the uh, all the 2000s, pretty much. Yeah, so you were tag partners with uh, Bob Cook for a while, weren't you? You held some titles. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Bob Cook. That was really one of the greatest guys I ever worked with. We had a lot of matches, too, on, on my shows mainly. But he was, I mean, you never ever knew how good he was until you hit in the ring. It's like Brad Armstrong type, you know? Yeah. It's just like everything so smooth and perfect and everything. I loved working with him. Yeah, we were tag team too. When did you start doing your own shows? When everything else folded. <laughs> 80, uh, 88 pretty much when uh, when I found out Crockett killed Florida wrestling. He acted like he was going to make it bigger and buy it. 
we were running seven. They were running seven shows a week every night. We were working. Right when Crocker took over, he changed it to once a month. It's like Steve Kern was like, "I guess we're gonna have to find other jobs. <laughs> One show a month. What the hell?" So I was like, "I'm gonna fucking start running shows. Look at this wide open territory. There's nobody running anything really in Orlando, especially this area." So, so I was running like three shows a, a week at first for a few years, a few years training people and everything, and then I started doing the bigger shows, so you know, guaranteed shows instead of losing money half the time when you try to rent, you never know, you know, rent buildings and all this stuff. Oh, yeah. But, I know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know, you know what I mean. So I just started doing, uh, you know, guaranteed show mostly all of them. At once, like nine, the late 90s, I started doing that only, guaranteed shows. And then uh, that was a lot better, <laughs> definitely. No worries. So was that and your uh, job after wrestling, after you were uh, done in the business? Yeah. Yeah, I was still wrestling, actually, up until I got the cancer and first diagnosed in 2013. I was still wrestling up until then, on my shows, you know. But, um, yeah, but Billy Gunn, yeah, that's one of the guys I, I started. And then, um, who else was it? Um, a lot of guys were on my shows that made it big later. I didn't really get in the ring of trouble. Rex King, though, I helped him a lot. He was, you know who Rex King is, right? Timothy mm. Well, well, oh, well he passed away, right? Yeah, he did. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. He had a pretty success. He was in WCW too for a bit, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah, and he, a lot of territory like Puerto Rico and Oregon and all. And I think WWF were all done. I know they were well done or something. I think him and the other guy that passed away too. Um, can't remember his name. Timothy Well yeah, and Stephen Dunn, Stephen Dahl or something. Steve, I think. Yeah, wasn't Steve Dahl. That's him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then I started, uh, I helped uh, Sean Royal pretty much. Yeah, he did, you know, from New Breed. Yeah. <laughs> he didn't even, he didn't even, Matsuda trained him, but he just trained how to do mainly like exercises and halfway kill him and squats and stuff. So he puts him in the ring with me to pretty much train him right in front of the audience. So I'm in the dressing room with him. I said, if this get me in a headlock, he goes, he never showed us that. I was like, you don't know how to do a headlock? <laughs> what the hell? That's what I had done. It was like wrestling a damn broom talk about wrestling on a broom oh my god but he got he got good he was a nice guy too Sean <laughs> funny did but you anyway. ever work Puerto Rico yourself they wanted me to everybody but I knew cause I they I knew I heard too many stories about the gimmick I was doing like with robes and blonde hair and everything they wanted to kill me no I just didn't want the uh, I heard the money you know you never knew yeah. I know you were over there but I this is like oh they always was, screwed with my pay on. That's why I was wondering. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was just Cologne only when I was always lost to go there. Pedro Morales, when I was in off a little bit, he first thing he asked me if I wanted to go to Puerto Rico. I was like, what the fuck, Puerto Rico? He's worked in front of WWF and he's asking me to go to Puerto Rico. And then everybody did. Brody, I mean, a lot of people asked me and I just, I never wanted to. I was like, because I heard too many stories about the pay part. And I had too many experiences in the Bahamas already with people trying to kill me. As I can imagine. Did you know Brody before he passed? Oh yeah, real good. Yeah, he, I was in Japan with him, and then he uh, he liked me because oh, I know why he liked me now <laughs> because he was in Hawaii that day um, that I told you about, and then the next day after the show, me and uh, I stayed with uh, Ken and Nagasaki because the hotels were like four hundred dollars a night. Yeah, in the in nineteen eighty six, but that was a hell of a payoff. I didn't expect it was like. You know, Lee, my V and uh, Ars Anderson weren't famous for being a good payoffs, you know. But I guess Anuki, it came from him because it was like fourteen hundred dollars for one shot. I was like back in the '86. That was like a damn good payoff for one match. Yeah. And then uh, yeah, and then so I was like stunned to get that. And then uh, so then we're walking down the beach to Honolulu the next day, and Bill Alfonso told me, "Go by King Curtis has a uh, what's this thing's called? He, he rented like things for people at Umbrella or something." Something he was renting then. Yeah, I think he had a, like a, like his son owns it now, or um, Prince, whatever, I.K., his name was. I can't remember his real name. Anyway, so he said, go to King Curtis. I only met Curtis a few times. And he's the scariest looking guy you ever seen, you know, back then. <laughs> Jesus, that head and everything, all the scars. And then he goes, uh, go to, um, Fonzo said, he's got the best weed there is, man. Go to King Curtis and bring some weed back from there. Hawaii, you know. And I never met Brody ever. So I walk up to King Curtis, finally found him in Kendo, 
he didn't even want to go over there. He just said, here he is over there going to Kendall State way across the street somewhere. <laughs> and I walked up to Brody and King Curtis. And there was another guy standing there. I didn't know who the hell he was, but I just said, hey, he goes, hey, brother. He remembered me a little bit from Florida. Curtis did, but I never met Brody. Brody's just looking at me like, and then I go, yeah, Bill Alfonso said that, I, you, know, you know, I get some weed. And he looked at me and goes, Brother, this is the uh, chief of police here, brother. You can't. Uh-huh. <laughs> and Brody started packing it because it was And he goes, no, you can't get it anymore, man. It's like they don't get it He started making all this stuff up. And Brody's just over there dying laughing like he had to walk away. Like. So he's like, if you had the ball to ask that in front of a cop, man, for weed. And then he like went after that. And then we were in Japan, my first tour in Japan, Brody. He didn't talk to anybody hardly, but he asked me and Kevin Kelly. Remember Nail? Yes. Kevin Kelly? Yeah. To go out to eat with him and stuff. He didn't really talk to nobody else. And then he wanted me to come to world class. He was looking there. Then he did some shots in Florida right after that. And he kept asking Sullivan. Kevin Sullivan was booking Florida. And he kept asking Sullivan, calling from Dallas, but that he wanted me to come to uh, Dallas to work uh, world class. And I almost didn't. It might have been about the time that, they, that happened to him over there. Puerto Rico right after that. It wasn't too long, I know. What, what year was, was it? You remember? Go ahead. Oh, 88. It was 1988, July. Yeah. So, yeah, it wasn't real long after he was asking me to go to uh, Texas. You mentioned uh, Nails. What was he like? Because I've always heard that he was legitimate, <laughs> uh, fairly tough. A tough guy. Yeah, he won tough man contests and stuff. Yeah, he. Um, I was in Oregon with him for a long time, so we were good friends. He was there for a long time in Oregon with me, but he, uh, we, we lived in the Bahamas. I don't know if you ever heard of that Bomber Hotel, Motel, well, Motel. No. the Bomber. It was like a, a lot of the rest of stayed there, yeah. <laughs> and all the rats knew, and they would, it was like a, like a horseshoe shaped thing, like a little cabin, like in Portland, and, uh, all the rats knew, and it was like the most famous territory for, I mean, women, <laughs> have you ever seen in your life? Oh my God. So, uh, ask any of the guys that's in there. So then the girls would circle there after. After the show on Saturday in Portland, come around the, the horseshoe looking for which rest I wanted them next, whatever. <laughs> that was like, this is the territory ever for that. But, um, yeah, Kevin Kelly, he, uh, I never seen him. No, I didn't wait him. I don't want to make him look bad. I hope he don't listen to this, but I saw Fujiwara over in Japan. Yeah. That was with Kevin Kelly. His first tour, he went to Japan, you know. So he, uh, and he wasn't really a skilled, you know, technical wrestler that, that they like. So they put me and Kevin Kelly against Maeda and Fujiwara. And it's like, they don't like the muscles crap over there. And now he's making his muscles and doing all that. And yeah. I'm like, oh, God. So Fujiwara ties him up, and he couldn't move until Fujiwara finally. You know, Fujiwara wasn't a big guy or nothing either. But you know who he is, right? Fujiwara. Yes. Yeah. And so he, uh, he tied him up so long. And then Kevin Kelly was so mad, but he couldn't do crap about it. And then... He uh, tagged me, and then they I did stuff with them. You know, they liked technical things and everything. They liked it, and they said, he came back to the dressing room, and Maeda said, you have good coach to me. And he goes, you, shit, you need to learn. He told him off. He said, you need to learn. Don't make muscle. Learn how to wrestle skill, you know. And he was like, oh, my God. He, they hated him over there, I'll tell you that. He never went back. And then all he wanted to do was get weed. I could go without it, you know, because yeah. you ain't going to get it back in them days over there. And, unless you, and he was asking all the cab drivers, where do you get marijuana, drug, drugs, dope, everything? And they're putting their hands together like handcuffs. Like, oh, 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 handcuffs. So they, and then he kept asking everybody for it, like every cab driver. So then finally they take, one of, us took, one of them took us to a hard rock cafe, Tokyo. And gave us some note he wrote in Japanese to hand to the waitress. <laughs> it was like, oh yeah, she's gonna give us pot. And they said, this is for you to go to something. It was like some bullshit thing. So Kevin Kelly was asking the waitress for marijuana too and everything. I'm like, oh my god, man, you're gonna get us put in fucking prison. <laughs> I asked the waitress for marijuana, and it was so funny. He had to be there for that. that was I think it's still a serious offense there to have that, from what I yeah. understand. I believe it because they asked me right when I first went there in the airport. First tour there, like, you got any marijuana with you? Because I had long hair, you know, and I was like, no. Kevin Kelly brought one with him in the airport, and where well, I met him in L.A., I remember the connection. Yeah. He went in, like, and he went in, like, one of the storage rooms and smoked it. And I said, I'm not doing that in the airport. <laughs> he did. He went, he said, I'm doing this before I get on that damn long flight. 
I said, no, it's okay, go ahead. <laughs> he did it, go. That anyway, was before anyway. edibles got popular, I guess. Oh, yeah. He was, yeah, he was pretty crazy, though. Funny about all the kind of stuff like that. But, so, yeah. uh, for your for your health issues, for people that don't know, you've been uh, battling uh, numerous health issues, as I said. We'll put the... Uh, your GoFundMe yeah. link in the the description, but uh, you've been going through hell in recent yeah. years. If you want to just tell people s some of the problems you've been having, yeah, like I said, I was doing real good shows and everything. You yeah, had to fly because I was doing them like all out west and California and Montana and New Orleans, all them places out there, casinos and Indian casinos and everything, Native American casino stuff like that. And then I got in 2013, I was diagnosed with the. Uh, colon cancer first and then had all the surgeries for that and the chemo chemo almost killed me because i was allergic to it so then i ended up for two months in the hospital for them trying to get the chemo out of me antidote <laughs> to get that out of me it was worse than having cancer and then uh, it spread to my liver then i had to have a liver resection have my liver taken out then they said bone it just kept spreading every time they'd mess with me so then i guess that led to other I, then i had to from all the scar tissue, from all the uh, surgeries I've had, I had a huge hernia. Then they did the what you call it. I had a bowel obstruction too. I had to have that surgery. That was just recently, like two years ago. I had that, and then it came back just six weeks ago. I had another one again. I had to have another surgery. So I just that happened again, and then I had <laughs> so much stuff you wouldn't even believe it. Then my heart, something happened. I don't know what they did to me, but um, they gave me too much anesthesia or something because then I had went into AFib. I couldn't even stand up or anything. I was like, my heart rate going up to like 170 or 180 or something. And then um, this just happened like recently. Then they had to do another procedure on me, a cardio version to shock your heart back into out of AFib, you know. Yeah. And then I have, so I have blood clots, pulmonary embolism, AFib, diabetes, <laughs> stage four cancer. So I don't know what else I could have. It's a miracle. Every time the doctors see me after some I don't go back to them sometimes like because they just keep trying to kill you. It seems like in Florida. <laughs> it's like the, uh, that's all they think about. It's like some chemo and all the stuff that I think just makes it spread more. And then they see me like after I went back a couple years later, they were like, they saw a ghost you know, and they thought, oh my God, you, su you survived still after all that. Most people don't after, you know, colon, colon and the liver. Because the one I had was like huge tumors in my liver, like and there's still one that they can't get. They said, and "I'm like, yeah, you ain't messing with me no more after all this stuff they've done." Because every time they did something, it spread somewhere else. Right. Because if they don't get all the cancer cells in that surgery that they do, then it, it spreads like that. They don't tell you all this crap. You gotta just learn yourself, read everything. <laughs> so you went from being in pretty good health to oh, yeah. terrible health really quickly. Yeah, I was wrestling on that. I was still on the wrestling on my shows and everything. And it was like, just happened. Well, I did have symptoms for a long time, like blood and like that, stuff like that. But I didn't feel that horrible at first. But then it did hit me pretty quick when that feeling. So yeah, you're, something was wrong. you're living okay. in Florida now? Yeah, Orlando. That's where I've been for all the way. For, to, well, I grew up in Ohio until I was like 15. Then we moved down here. But then I I lived everywhere, really, into all the territories, you know, like a year in Oregon, a year in Charlotte, like six months in Memphis, everywhere, pretty much. A lot of different territories I was at. Are you married like, or anything? I was two times already. Okay. <laughs> you learned your lesson yeah. after two. <laughs> yeah. 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 I had enough. So, so if people want to donate to your GoFundMe to help cover your medical costs, I guess they can just search Jerry Gray on GoFundMe, or if they're hearing this, we'll put a, a link in the description. But that yeah, that yeah. helps cover your uh, your costs because yeah. it's not covered in the U.S. I guess like it is here in Canada. Oh no, 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 it's, no, no, not at all. Yeah, I really appreciate it. They've helped me a lot. So. That's the only way I survive, really. Everybody saved my life, all the, all the listeners out there on these podcasts and interviews and everything, shoot interviews. Well, so, thanks right. for uh, thanks for talking to us. I appreciate it. You have some great stories. Maybe down the road uh, we could check in with you again. 
Yeah, that's why I said hopefully I get to meet you sometime. I'm, I wanted to say how good the Cauliflower Alley is. Uh, Brian Blair has been to me too and everything lately. He uh, There's a new um, benevolent fund chairperson, Darlene Christ, and she's uh, really doing a great job on the board and everything. And they, they've helped me like for the last three years. I mean, any amount is like a fortune to me. So I'm in mean, there. Really, Brian Blair's really improved the cauliflower like that for sure. And yeah, he's doing he's been, a great job with it, and yeah. I've been there the past couple of years uh, helping yeah, spread the word. Yeah, I saw your interviews with Bob Cook, and was that where Bob Roop was, or that was a different one? Uh, I think Bob Roop was, uh, I've seen him a couple of times. Yeah, he was the booker down here when I was working for him down here, too, so he. He was a nice guy. Did you see that video, speaking of Bob Roop, of the where they basically broke kayfabe, it came out this year? It was a... All the guy talking yeah, Malenko? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God, yeah. I, I saw it. But Were you shocked was, seeing that yeah. after knowing Bob? Mm, no, because they were pissed. Like, the, I mean, it's the truth. All the promoters, and that's why I wanted to be a promoter. I was like, fuck. These guys are making all the damn money. I remember in Orlando, at a fair in 1985 or something, they told us, we're getting $10,000 for this fair. That's 1985, you know. And then they give us, they only had like maybe seven guys on the show. They give us like 50, 60 bucks each or whatever. I was thinking, I, I'm just going to take all these damn shows and fairs. What the hell? They don't even have any good names on these shows, really. I mean, Barry Wyndham was like the only one they had that was a, they didn't put every all the big top guys on the fair show, you know. It was like a spot show to them. Yeah. But then I did take all them fairs too when they right when they folded. I started getting all the every fair they had. They used to have. Well, they did try to run against me. I'll, I'll have to go another interview to all that. So Mike Graham and Kern, Kern tried to come back with Florida wrestling again with Gordon Soley, and I was running my thing. And then, but I still got all the fairs. <laughs> they were so pissed. It wasn't like the real championship wrestling from Florida. It was like an outlaw, but there was the real people like Grant, Mike Graham, and Kern. And, but Matt Suda was more on my side. So. Steve Kern, the few times I've met him, he seems to be pretty high on himself. Well, I'll tell you, he, Mike Graham, I mean, we were like enemies like at that time because I ran against them shows. It was like the same thing, like Eddie Graham with Louis Tillette. So I was running all my towns, and then he was running his, and I was using big names like Black Jack Mulligan and Harry Funk and everybody, and, and he was trying to get them too, but he wasn't paying them good like I was, and then he's trying to rip them off. And then, because uh, I remember Dory told me that Mike Graham wanted him for three shots, and Mike Graham said, okay, 300, and Dory goes, 300 for each day, right? And he goes, no, for all three shows. And I was paying Dory like 500 for each show. It was like $100 a show for the from back then on top of And I was like, yeah. yeah. Well, but, but anyway, that, it's just like, uh, what did you just ask me before that? Something about the... Uh, oh, I was just saying that when I've I've met Steve Kern on a few occasions, oh, sure, yeah, he yeah. just <laughs> seems like... <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, he wasn't exactly a, the biggest star. I mean, he had a couple good runs, no. but you'd think he was Hulk Hogan. Uh, oh, he... Well, you know what he did? It, it was like the weirdest thing ever. He, uh, when me and Bob Cook, they dropped the... Florida tag team belts to us and it, and it was like Mike Graham was the owner and, and Kern didn't want to do the job so Mike Graham said I'll do it it's been me he's <laughs> like what the fuck that's what you call a damn big head <laughs> the owner says I'll do it and then, and Mike Graham well, I met him at a what kind of hall of fame they had like Florida right when I first got the cancer like in 2013 or something like that yeah. I met him after all those years and we were, I thought we'd probably get, have a lot of heat you know because I kind of took all those fairs from him and everything he was complaining about it I remember back then like all the damn fairs we used to have. And then, uh, so he seen me and I looked a lot different because I didn't have no hair or anything. I had all the chemo and stuff. And then I shook his hand and said, Jerry Grant goes, Jerry Grant, oh my God. Real nice. I think. That was right before he killed himself too. It was really weird. He was so happy that night and everything. And then, uh, and that was the last time I ever seen him. But then Kern, I think he probably still don't like him because of that fucking 30 years ago. So he, uh, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I was all right with him, but not, you know, I wasn't the best friends or anything. And if people want up. to uh, follow you on social media, I know you got Facebook, Jerry Gray. Yeah. Uh, do you have Twitter or anything? No, I don't have a computer even. My cell phone's what I use, so I'm 
my computer doesn't work anymore. So I, I try to do Twitter, but I gotta learn a lot more. I'm not too great on that yet. I see. Yeah, I haven't fig Facebook. quite figured that one out yet either. Yeah, it's just like what the hell. I'm not into every second being on the computer, you know, every minute typing stuff, putting people down or whatever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But anyway, yeah, I like to listen to like good shoot interviews. Though. That's why I said I'm always looking for on your thing. Well, if I'm it. ever back in uh, Orlando, I'll uh, try and look oh, you up yeah. for a shoot interview. Oh yeah, that'd be great. No problem, man. Sounds good. Well, I thanks. Thanks a lot for uh, for talking to us. As I said, anyone listening will put his GoFundMe link right in the yeah. description. Anything can help a guy like uh, Jerry Gray and if you were a wrestling fan I mean this guy gave his life to wrestling and uh, everyone has medical problems and anything will help I'm sure five dollars ten dollars yeah. it all adds up oh yes it does all right I really appreciate it Hannibal thank you very much keep up the good work brother thank you sir have a great night you too man I'll okay. send this I'll send you the link uh, when it's up in the next couple of days Oh, okay, good. Thank you, man. I really appreciate that. Awesome. Nice talking Thanks, to you. Thanks, man. Hey, tell Billy Graham I said hi. Golden Boy, great. I remember him, yeah. I will. I'll send <laughs> him a... Uh, plane flight from hell. <laughs> the real plane flight from hell. I'll send, send him a message hi. about that, and I'll let you know what he says. I think he remembers it, because that was pretty damn scary. I don't know how many times that mean, we were going to die. We thought, like Bobby Shane and all the other crashes they had. That year, a couple of years before that, well, it was, well, it was 83 and this happened. <laughs> oh, I'm sure he remembers it. I'll actually, if I ever uh, do another interview with him, I'll ask him about it. Yeah, because he was praying. I mean, his face looked like, it scared the hell out of me because I was only like a kid. Like, I thought they were joking at first. And then they started, and then when we knew we were going to live, they started saying, if we land on an island, I don't know who I'm going after. They started ribbing me then because I'm like 19 and bleach blonde hair and tan and everything. <laughs> <laughs> And Billy, and Paul was like, oh, we used to look like that, Billy. And Billy was like, yeah, Billy. That's hilarious. <laughs> it's funny. But, uh, okay, man, I appreciate it again. Oh, Good thanks. Thank you, buddy. Take care.